This episode is brought to you by ARX. You want to be a successful strength training studio owner. The problem is you aren't able to deliver the safest, most efficient and effective workouts, making it harder for you to attract and retain clients, which makes you feel frustrated. I understand that it can be difficult to differentiate your business without the right tools. ARX's breakthrough adaptive resistance technology uses patented motorized resistance and computer software to give you and your clients the perfect workout every single time. BioFit founder John Zarbock says that ARX is clearly the superior tool to deliver the exercise stimulus. My clients are seeing insane improvements in weeks, not months. I could not fathom running my business without ARX. So here's how you get started. Number one, go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB to get $500 off your ARX machines. Number two, book a call with the ARX sales team. And number three, learn how ARX can help you grow your strength training business. Go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB so you can stop struggling to attract and retain clients and start to grow your strength training business with confidence. Lauren Snell here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics, and the strategies to help you grow your strength training business. This is episode 361. This is part five of the High Intensity Training Fundamentals series with Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan is a master super slow instructor and owner of Strong Life Personal Training in Barrington, Illinois. If you prefer to read and would like to download the transcript PDF for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and click podcast and select episode 361 to download the transcript. You can contact him to learn more about his services to studio owners and personal trainers, including workshops, mentoring, and seminars by going to his website, stronglifetraining.com, or emailing Tim to info at stronglifetraining.com. Tim, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Lawrence. Glad to be here. Great to have you again. And as always, really appreciate you investing so much time with me on this podcast to complete this series. And uh, it's great to see that we're at part five. We've still got so much to cover. Um, <laughs> so excited today to to maybe wrap up some of the stuff related to, to time under load, an optimal uh, window for time under load that we covered last time, but then also get into the, the, how to determine optimal weight load resistance for clients and form discrepancies and so on and so forth. So take it away. I'm happy to start wherever you want to carry on from. <laughs> All right. Yeah, just tie up a few loose ends from last time and kind of bring it together. And then we'll start to move on to uh, uh, other topics that are, you know, kind of somewhat logically related to this. But, um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about um, time under load last time, not only defining the terms, but uh, kind of defining the optimal window, if you will, for time under load. And we talked about this need to sort of stay within the anaerobic uh, energy system so that we're uh, progressively recruiting through through those muscle fibers, uh, fatiguing them, bringing them, you know, to ultimately to the point of momentary failure within that anaerobic window. And I kind of outlined that, you know, on the low end, maybe 45 seconds of, of load time and on the high end, maybe having this all kind of wrap up by about 90 seconds load time um, and, and not getting into these re, really excessive time under loads beyond that. Um, so, you know, when we're moving forward into, you know, really kind of nailing down the the, uh, the weight load that we're using that corresponds with that and even, you know, the amount of repetitions that may be performed within that window Um, this is where it starts to get more to the practical aspect. So, um, you know, the, on, on the obvious, uh, level this time under load. So if if we know that we want to achieve momentary muscular failure within say 45 to 90 seconds, um, then obviously we have to train with a weight load that's going to bring that about, but, you know, there is kind of some, some art to this, or there's some things to be aware of maybe that kind of influence this. 
where um, you know you can certainly, through trial and error, find a weight that somebody can lift for at least forty five seconds and you know can't lift for more than ninety seconds, and they they reach failure by that point. But I think sometimes that based on a subject's skill level, based on a subject's motivation and tolerance for, you know, some of the discomforts related to exercise and so forth, that oftentimes you may get somebody that appears to achieve failure within that window, but then again, (laughs) they're not really at failure from a physiological standpoint. And some of this pertains to um, their, you know, their willingness to push and really legitimately achieve failure and not just sort of mentally give up or, you know, psychologically, mentally reach a point where they're just not going to push anymore, you know, so a lot of times people can, you know, on the surface appear to be at failure, but they're really not. And I I just experienced this yesterday, I was um, working with uh, an individual who's actually a trainer, a high intensity trainer at at another facility that I'm kind of uh, assisting and consulting with. Um, and I, I took one of their trainers through a, a workout and I knew from past experience doing a little bit of work with this trainer that he really is not somebody that's, you know, really works very hard. I, I don't, I don't really think that he's that into the training, despite the fact he's, he's, he's an instructor and a trainer in this, he, he just doesn't seem to be <laughs> that into it, but, um, at any rate, I, I took him through a workout and he, you know, performed very slow, smooth repetitions. He maintains his, his form well. He, he, you know, behaves in that regard that if you're just observing him, he's, he's very slow, controlled, smooth. He sits still. He doesn't squirm around. He doesn't resort to bad techniques or things like that. But at the same time, there's almost no apparent effort coming from this person at all. Um, he, he's just going along and then all of a sudden the repetition just stops and he can't move anymore. And he's not, uh, he's not showing any signs of exertion. He's not breathing heavy. He's not really showing any signs of effort that, that he's, he's giving his maximal you know, ability there. He just reaches a point where it just stops. And, you know, despite all types of encouragement and so forth, he, the weight stops moving, he doesn't go anywhere. And, you know, he'll just make a comment like, Oh, that's all I got, (laughs) you know, but, but he'll get off the exercise then and just, you know, no signs that he just exerted. (laughs) So um, what I started doing with him is when he reached that point, you know, on a couple of them, I gave him sort of a, little assisted rep to try to maybe get through the sticking point and see if he could continue on. And uh, I'd give him that assisted rep and then ask him to, you know, very slowly control the downward, but, you know, negative stroke, um, and then try to encourage him to attempt another repetition. And a couple of times what happened, in fact, he, he was moving so, so slow that by the time he was at his perceived failure point, I said, okay, and you know, I, I give him that assist rep, he'd come down real slow and I'd say, okay, next time, as you come down to the bottom here and you make your turnaround, I want you to just give me all out every bit of effort you have and forget about trying to move slow at this point, just push as hard as you can and lift that weight. I don't care if you go faster, okay? Um, and he'd come down and then all of a sudden he'd just zip the weight would go right up. Okay. And I'd say, try it again and zip it go right up. And he'd do two or three more reps and you're thinking, thinking, okay, (laughs) I thought this guy was at failure. And now all of a sudden he just did three reps and I I wouldn't say he jerked it up, but maybe he lifted the weight in a couple of seconds. Mm. And this was after being at failure, after me giving him an assisted rep, him doing a very slow negative, suddenly he's got all this gas left, okay? And this, I think, harkens back to what I said in one of the earlier sessions where with a lot of people, 
this focus on moving ultra, ultra slow turns them passive, okay? They're, they're being so gentle and they're pushing with such mild effort in their attempt to just simply move slow that they're not really uh, exerting at a high level. They're not generating a lot of deep muscle, muscle contraction or muscle tension and force is, is not being produced. Um, and it seems like all the focus is just behaving perfectly, but internally, they don't really have that intensity, that high level of effort and so forth. And as I kind of discussed, once those shackles are <laughs> released and you say, okay, stop trying to go so slow and just push hard. Mm -hmm. Suddenly he's got all this, this uh, gas left in the tank um, and he puts more effort because now all of a sudden, because he's not trying to move so slow, he is able to engage you know, at a higher level and put push at a higher level. And he's got enough uh, muscle force left in him that he can easily pr perform that. So uh, long story short, I think what happens with, with a lot of this is that uh, you, uh, an un, un, you know, uh, initiated instructor in, into this concept would observe this person and think, well, geez, he, you know, he reached failure. He couldn't do any more repetitions. Uh, he reached failure and it was in the time under load window that we're looking for. And okay, that's the right weight load. But, you know, obviously it wasn't the right weight load because even after he was at, you know, so-called failure, all of a sudden he had several more repetitions in him and he didn't even really truly reach failure. Okay. So when we're return, uh, trying to determine this time under load, you, you've got to work these other issues out first and make sure that a person is really truly working at a high intensity and truly engaging their maximal ability of those muscles to, to put out that, that effort and that you're getting a legitimate failure in the first place. Um, could you, could yeah. you jack the weight up for that subject and, or, or would he then just quit sooner? Well, I, you know, I, I think much soon, too soon. Maybe. Yeah. I think from experience, what would happen. And in fact, th this did happen on some of the exercises because I had worked with him a little bit before and I knew he was like this. So I tried to give him a heavier weight load, you know, right from the start and he would just act like he couldn't lift it. Okay. And then I'd have to strip the weight and get to a level that he would, you know, lift it. But this is the same symptom there. It's that the reason he couldn't lift it is because again, he wasn't really trying hard. He was so focused on being sort of gentle and slow and sort of this, this passive effort that he wasn't really digging in and engaging and trying to, to lift the weight. So um, this actually brings up a good point is that when you're truly lifting, you know, the proper weight load, all right, number one, from the very first rep, it's going to be hard to move. Okay. You, if you're training with a weight load that you're capable of just from the first rep, you know, zipping it up with, without much effort, um, you're not going to reach failure within the proper time load. Okay. Or the time under load. So you've, you've got to number one, be willing to engage at a high level, right from the start, which it's going to take some effort. It's going to be difficult to move right from the start. And we talked about this earlier where, you know, sometimes on those big, heavy exercises, like leg press, let's say you need to give sort of that assisted rep just to get yeah. the, the weight moving at first. What other then, exercises might you give that assisted rep to start? Like leg press is one we do. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if there's other ones as well, like maybe chest press or other ones you might do that for. Right. I, I would say probably, you know, number one, the leg press for sure. Mm -hmm. um, chest press, uh, maybe a pull down, uh, sometimes a row, uh, you know, like a compound row. Um, those types of bigger, heavier compound movements seem to be the ones that you have to, to help get that subject engaged a little and, and get things moving. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at things where, um, you know, where the, where the loads are heavier, there's bigger muscle groups kind of thing. Um, and, you know, not, not that I wouldn't ever do it on any of the other exercises. It kind of depends on the person, but um, 
you know, I think those are the big ones that you tend to have to kind of give that light assist just to set things into motion and get somebody engaged. Yeah, right? more, more, probably more uncomfortable than most exercises, those big multi joints, right? And they're also utilizing yeah. a lot more musculature, so it requires a lot more effort. That, that's probably yeah. why, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and another thing, like if I'm doing a neck exercise, um, what I tend to do with the neck exercise, so let's say neck extension, you know, extending back, um, I will position the person, get them into the neutral position. So they're, you know, their head is neutral, head and neck is neutral. They're looking straight ahead. The, the movement arm is typically about in the halfway position and will perform a transfer in that position where I'll gradually hand off uh, that load to them while they're gradually engaging, building tension in their neck. And we make that transition where that load is transferred to them in the neutral position. And then I ask them from that position to start extending back. Um, so they'll do the full extension and then they'll do that negative where they're coming down and, uh, you know, coming into the, the bottom position to make that first turnaround. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially they've had sort of a rep and a half before they get to that, that lower turnaround. Um, and by that point, they're fully engaged. They're in control of the load. Their muscles have sort of registered all of that. And there's a little bit of that built in warm up uh, by the time they you know, get to that f first lower turnaround. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important because uh, number one, to get positioned in that exercise and to have their head in the right position, engaged with the pad, you know, you don't want to start in the fully flexed position at, at that point and try to get out of that. Um, um, and I, th I think it's just safer uh, to begin in that sort of mid-range position. So there will be some things that will do that um, the leg press, you're obviously not going to do that because <laughs> as a trainer, you're, you're not going to lift the load up and hand them, hand them that heavy load of the leg press in the midway position, you know? So they're starting at the bottom on the leg press, but then we're kind of doing that first rep, kind of engaging it together to some degree to get things set into motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so, so back to this, this, uh, proper weight load is that, you're, you're going to be, in most cases, you're going to be lifting a load that is difficult right out of the gate, that it, it's hard to, you know, set into motion and get going. And in, in other words, you're going to have to pretty well engage at a high level from the first rep, okay? Um, obviously, it's still submaximal to some degree because you're going to be able to do several repetitions with that and, you know, continue on for a minute or more. But, but what I find is that if, if people are training with a weight load that seems easy to them at, at first, um, they're not really going to reach failure in the proper time under load. They're going to go too long. Okay. And, and this becomes an issue with people that, uh, you know, they want to feel like it's easy for the first few repetitions and gradually gets harder. Um, but particularly with the slow movement speeds and so forth, it's going to be hard, hard at the start. Okay. So I think what happens with a lot of people where it fools you into thinking that they're training with the right load is that one people achieve this false failure, like I've been describing. Um, and two, they're not really engaging with a heavy enough weight load at the start, because again, they're tending to kind of be passive. They're tending to just put forth kind of a mild effort at start. And uh, they never really even engage that weight load at a, you know a high enough weight load from the from the get go. So you know th this becomes again a, a lot of work to get somebody to to comply and and do that stuff. And I, th I think we already kind of um, discussed the point that the this assist at the start to get things set into motion is is a way of tricking them to train with the heavier load because once they get this load set into motion once their muscles and the nervous system kind of registers the load and they they see that they can handle it and their body is sort of activated the muscles at a higher level they can then get things 
keep things going from there. Um, you know, so, but you, you really need to get the person to get a true failure to know whether they're at the right weight load. And, uh, you know, if a person sort of reaches failure, but they're passive, they're not breathing heavy, they're not showing any real signs of exertion or effort, there doesn't appear to be, you know, a lot of engagement on their part, but they're pretending they're at failure, okay, you don't really have the right weight load. And as the subject I just explained, when I took the shackles off them and said, okay, let, let's just focus, push harder, you know, really engage at a higher level, stop trying to move so slow, just push hard. And then suddenly he was able to keep going and do it. Um, you know, that was a clear sign that he wasn't really truly at failure. So this person, a person like this is, is going to take a lot of effort to, to work with in order to teach them to engage at a higher level and create more muscle tension and, you know, start to train at a higher level. And, and, uh, uh, I know through experience that a lot of people, you know, this is a hindering factor that, that this is a limiting factor that they are going to limit their own results because they're not willing to work hard and they're not willing to really engage the muscles at a higher level and train to a true state of failure, uh, to true state of failure and get to that, that deeper levels of fatigue. So, um, so what we, we want to make sure we're doing is, is getting as close as possible to a true failure and getting that failure to occur within that time window of maybe 45 to 90 seconds, ideally. Okay. Um, so once we've established that, you know, if you, if you want to pay attention to how many repetitions somebody performs, um, then you're going to correlate that based on what what is the speed of the repetition so if you're somebody that's doing let's say more of the standard nautilus protocol of two seconds up and you know four seconds down roughly six seconds per rep you know that falls back into like nautilus used to recommend is maybe an eight to twelve uh, repetitions per your set because that's going to put you maybe 48 seconds to you know, 172 seconds, 48 to 72 seconds, or, um, you know, a minute 12 there. Um, so that's going to be within your window. But if you're training with, let's say, a five second positive and a five second negative type of cadence, so 10 seconds per rep, I mean, you're going to maybe be doing somewhere between four to eight reps within that time under load window. If you're doing more of a traditional super slow, say 10 seconds up, 10 seconds down, you may be training on the low end with two or three reps to a high of maybe, you know, four, you know, five or six reps at, at the very most. Um, so th those repetitions and correlations are going to be based on what speed your repetitions are being performed at, but ultimately you're still need to pay attention to that time under load window because you don't want these sets going on, you know, over two minutes, two and a half, three minutes, three and a half minutes, which what I've seen with a lot of people, particularly with super slow, they're just on the machine for three, yeah. three plus minutes or more. And quite frankly, if you're training with a load that allows you to train that long, you're not really training with a heavy enough weight load. Um, you need to get those loads heavier and achieve failure sooner. But of course, this brings us to the next situation is that with a lot of subjects, when you get the proper weight load on them, um, they start behaving badly. Okay. They start to developing a lot of form discrepancies and <laughs> these form form discrepancies. Sorry to interrupt you, know, you Tim, before we get there yeah. though, I don't yeah. know if you were now going into form discrepancies is, how do we actually determine the optimal weight for someone, okay. you know, the optimal resistance? Because I think, I don't yeah, know whether you so, were coming back to that, but I feel like we might have skipped over it. Yeah. Right. I, I think maybe one one last thing I could tie in with that yep. is that, so obviously we're, we're trying to ascertain whether we're getting a true effort out of a person, they're yep. really training to failure. Okay. And once they achieve that failure and you're satisfied that you've got a pretty solid effort and they, you know, couldn't couldn't do any more than that. Um, now registering what was the time under load that they reached failure to. 
or, or you know, this idea of time to concentrate failure, what time period did they reach failure in? And is that within the 45 to 90 second window? And if it is, okay, then you've, you've got the proper weight load. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're going on beyond <clears throat> the time under load window and you're seeing that they're up over a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, and you know, they haven't reached failure yet, or maybe they're just reaching failure at sort of an excessive time time period, then you're going to raise that weight load and try to bring them down into that range where they're supposed to be. Of course, on the low end, if somebody reached failure too soon, then you've got to back some weight off and, and allow them to go a little bit longer. But you're just kind of through trial and error, uh, training them to the point of failure, seeing where that uh, point of failure occurs in the time scale. And that if they're within the window, then good. If they're outside of the window, make the adjustments up and down. Um, and one thing I probably should add to this, um, one way of kind of un- understanding whether they're, they're truly training with the right weight load is, uh, you know, let, let's say they achieve failure and you think they're within the range. A lot of times what people do then is that, uh, you know, the trainers will sort of start to micro load where they put just a couple pounds more, you know, with the MedEx, you can raise two pound increments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And even with Nautilus, if you get these little add on weights and things like that, you can make small increments and some trainers will, you know, they'll add two pounds or they'll add a pound. And, you know, some people get into this idea of adding a half a pound and just these really kind of micro loading. And that stuff's certainly appropriate with a really advanced subject that you're certain is really training hard and giving you their all and, and, and sort of things like that. But um, one thing that you can kind of test is that um, for, for a subject that, you know, is, is, is not maybe at that ultra, ultra advanced level, but somebody trains to failure within a certain range and Try, try experiment with adding weight a little more aggressively and see what happens to their time under load. So let's just theoretically say somebody fails in 90 seconds, all right? And then the next workout they come in, uh, try to, you know, raise it 10 pounds and, and see what happens to their time under load. A lot of times you'll find that you raise it 10 pounds and the person, again, achieves 90 seconds. And the next could time that be indicative in, of them not being really pushing to failure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would it would be indicative of somebody that you know was not really ultimately engaged at that highest level. So mm-hmm. you know, because somebody that really is truly you know engaged at that high level and achieved a legitimate failure, um, and they're at the right you know truly correct time a uh, weight load. Uh, you're going to see that if you tried to add 10 pounds, that that time under load is going to drop significantly. You know, yeah. it, it may drop 30 seconds or 20 seconds or something like that. Um, but if you add 10 pounds or something to it and the, the time under load doesn't drop and maybe even the time under load increases, like we understand obviously that somebody's going to get stronger and they're going to be able to train with progressively heavier weight loads, but that big of a jump from one workout to the next, if, if they don't significantly drop in time under load, it's probably an indication that they weren't training with a heavy enough weight load in the first place. Okay. And, yeah. and I've, I've talked to trainers where sometimes they just, as an experiment, they'll, they'll sneak 20 pounds more on the subject <laughs> and just see what happens. Okay. I love this and, idea. Yeah. yeah. Can I, can know, I just yeah. make one, one comment quickly? Sure. You know, um, just to add color to what you're saying, or add more, more sort of narrative. Um, like our policy is to add two pounds depending on where they are in the ideal rep range for their particular protocol. Right. Um, yeah. but you're absolutely right. Some people are sandbagging and some people will, you know, we could, we, there is an opportunity there to, maybe one workout increase the weight quite significantly, as you're saying, to really see if they're using a maximum effort and to figure out if we've got the weight right at the start. So I love this as a a way of breaking away from the normal process to just make sure that you are actually you know, giving this client the ideal weight and giving them a, you know an effective workout experience. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, so, sometimes what will happen is you'll, you'll add 10 pounds or something and the person, they don't even notice it. They don't even make yeah. a remark that it's heavier. Case in and, point. Yeah. Right. And and they just proceed and they do the same time under load as the previous workout or maybe even longer. And they don't even kind of recognize that the weight was 10 pounds heavier. If you're getting something like that, you clearly weren't heavy enough in the first place. But think about this, like you just said, if you if you're only trying to add two pounds, two pounds, two pounds, um, what you might not realize is that, okay, so it may take you five workouts to ultimately add 10 pounds, okay? And you may perceive that to be, geez, they've improved every workout and they got stronger and stronger and stronger. And every time they come in, I can add a couple pounds and they keep getting stronger. Um, but what you don't realize is that they could have handled 10 pounds heavier <laughs> way back when, um, and you took five sessions to gradually get them 10 pounds heavier, when in reality, they could have had handled the 10 pounds five workouts ago, okay? So you yep. think they made progress, when in reality, you just took five sessions to get them up to what they could have done in the first place. This episode is brought to you by ARX. These are the most intense exercise machines I've ever used. I remember how fast a pull-down exercise took me to muscular failure and beyond. On the final negative or eccentric excursion, my tank was practically empty, but the adaptive resistance enabled me to continue to perform work until the predetermined end of the set. This experience was very profound and made me realize how effective ARX is in helping clients reach a high level of intensity in their workouts and ultimately produce the best results. I also love how ARX measures and tracks range of motion, rep cadence, total output and time, and more with real-time audio and visual feedback. These features are powerful sales and retention tools to help you convert and keep more clients. As a listener of the High Intensity Business Podcast, ARX is offering you $500 off your machines. Just go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB to book a call with the ARX sales team to learn how ARX can revolutionize and grow your fitness business. Again, go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB and now back to the episode. Okay. One one counter to this, right, yeah. is, you know, we use a lot of advanced techniques. So the end of the set, you know, we obviously we're, we're always trying to get someone to muscle failure in the first set, right? Let's make that absolutely clear. But we're using slow negatives, assisted repetitions, rest pause, um, drop sets, et cetera, et cetera, to help someone reach a high level of intensity if they struggle to get the failure on the first set or if they just really want that additional intensity. That's our own method. Um, now one thing we haven't really touched on though, is I hear what you're saying about, you know, yes, maybe we're the person's cheating themselves a little bit, or maybe we're even cheating the person, but there's a psychological adherence factor here, right? When people see that weight going up incrementally, even if it's not necessarily true reflection of, of improvement, they're more likely to stick at it. And that's then going to make them more likely to get better results over the long term. So I think that yeah. would be one way of looking at this or what do you make of that? Yeah, no, I think that's a legitimate point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's certainly psychologically or emotionally satisfying to person. If you say, geez, for the last 20 workouts, every time you've been here, I've added two pounds, I've added two pounds and you've been incrementally going up, up, up. You're making progress every single workout. Okay. So from that standpoint, based on their, workout performance and baked based on their chart numbers, they're, they're obviously making progress with each session. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't do that. Okay. Particularly, you know, when you're starting a person from scratch and you're teaching them and you're building them up and they're getting acclimated to the program and they're progressing along and all that, that's exactly, you, you know, a, a, a legitimate you know, tactic to follow. Um, 
you know, what I'm kind of describing though, is after somebody has been here for a while and once they're more acclimated to the training and maybe they've been at this a few months and, you know, generally they're behaving, they've developed some good workout skills and things like that, then maybe experiment with getting a little more aggressive um, with, with the weight loads just to see what happens and to see what happens to their time under load. But, um, at any rate, certainly what you're describing is, is emotionally satisfying, but at the same time, you want to counterbalance that with the fact that ultimately you want them to experience true physic, physical change. You know, you, you want them not just to be improving on their chart and on their numbers and everything, but they should be experiencing a physical change that they're noticing, you know, obviously a feeling of increased strength and increased endurance and energy in their daily life. Uh, they're noticing maybe changes in their muscles and getting more firmed and, you know, muscle tone and so forth, uh, maybe starting to build improved shape and appearance of their muscles and, you know, all of these things that they're experienced, that's ultimately what we want to achieve in people. So we don't want it to just be merely chart performance or you know, something. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you do have to kind of counterbalance it. And this is where, you know, some of the art of being an exercise instructor is knowing your subject, uh, kind of manipulating these variables um, and knowing when you can be a little more aggressive with somebody and when yeah. you should just, you know, hold it back and keep refining their form and and their their effort and techniques and, and all of this sort of stuff. So let, let me ask you a question, one more question on this. I think sure. for us, it's like we get around the arbitrary uh, recording, which might sometimes happen through advanced technique, because we know for advanced techniques, we're going to get them pretty smoked or at least as, as intense a workout as they can manage. What do you make of that? Do you think that's cheating from an instructor perspective? Do you think I should, we should be more focused on being smarter about um, that single set and increasing the weight? Obviously, within the time frame you you suggested, what what do you think of that as a as a way of approaching this? Yeah, you're referring to is it legitimate to use all those advanced techniques and as a, yeah, because you know, if you want, I'm thinking best of both worlds. I guess I'm thinking, can we microload this client to show them progress? You know, in a in a nice report, which is going to help them adhere, and then make sure they actually do get the meaningful stimulus through advanced techniques, right? So that's why yeah. I'm saying, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, so my general position on those advanced techniques is that. Um, they can be legitimate and very helpful. And, you know, I certainly use them with certain people um, because as you pointed out, ultimately we do have to get them to the point where the intensity is there, the effort is there, the, the muscle fatigue, you know, all of that is achieved in a workout. So, you know, sometimes you need to employ these techniques in order to get that person to that level and bring them to you know, an adequate level of stimulation to, to do what we're, you know, we're after. Okay. But on the flip side, my position would be is that if you are dealing with a subject that is really, truly giving you their all, and when they're getting to failure, they're truly at muscle failure and they've, you know, completely exhausted their muscles to the point that, you know, there's nothing more that they can do. Okay. With that person, I, I think uh, applying a lot of sort of post failure techniques, whether they be assisted reps to force them to keep going or breakdowns and, you know, whatever, you know, slow negatives and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it, it, if, if that's what you're doing with one of those, you know, more advanced legitimate effort subjects, I think you can really overdo it. Okay. Yeah, no, because, that's a really good point. Well, and not, yeah. not only can you really overdo it, but I don't think at some point with, with the really advanced subjects that's giving you their all, I think a lot of that stuff can be counterproductive uh, mm -hmm. to the point where I don't think it's going to achieve anything more beyond their true training to failure. Um, yeah. You know, it's just more, those are set extenders and certainly you can, you know, cause, you know, just a lot of torture to the person, yeah. but I don't know that there's going to be any, um, 
achieving of extra results beyond what that person already gave you uh, on their own. Okay. So e even looking at some of the studies, I know there have been some studies that shown that some of these techniques do enhance results, but I, I think probably what's going on there is that they're enhancing results with people that weren't really giving. Yeah. I was going to say, are there? Cause I'm thinking, I know discover strength did a study a while back um, with, with advanced techniques and they saw, I'm, I'm, I might be getting this right and you can correct me or someone can correct me if I get this wrong, but they saw no, I can't remember what they were measuring strength or probably strength, um, maybe hypertrophy as well, but they saw no improvement with the advanced technique, but it didn't, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't then use it for other purposes like variety and novelty and helping yeah. the client adhering and helping make the workout exciting for them over the longer term, which I, I believe that's a great reason to use them. And that's one of the reasons why we use them. Um, yeah, I'm under no illusion that I don't know. I don't think maybe you can correct me, Tim, but I don't th didn't think that, like you said, if you're someone who can train to a high level of intensity to true muscular failure in a single set, um, that they're going to provide much more in the way of, um, results, uh, yeah. or, you know, so yeah, right. that's, that's my take. Well, it, it, as far as that, maybe discover strength study, I, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that one specifically, mm -hmm. but I know a number of years ago, Wayne Westcott, who's a exercise physiologist, uh, from Boston, Massachusetts, and he's done a lot of research and, uh, studies on various topics. And, I believe he at one point did a study with advanced techniques and I, I found out that, you know, it did seem to enhance results, but um, my, my position would be that they're certainly helpful in certain circumstances, certainly helpful with those uh, people that maybe are not getting to a true state of failure on their own. And you're trying to induce more yeah. fatigue. And um, e even from a standpoint of getting a person to tolerate the higher intensities, I, I think some of some of these techniques can be helpful because putting a person through that and getting them accustomed to that intensity and that deeper level of fatigue may translate into them being able to then train harder on their own. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. You know, so I, I'm not saying don't use them, but I think they have to be used smartly yeah. um, and in the right circumstances and with the right person and they can probably be helpful, but um, with a person that's really given a, 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 a given you all they got in the first place, I don't think they're going to add anything to it. Um, it's just going to be more extending and it's just going to be a lot of nervous system fatigue where you just keep firing and firing and firing <laughs> those nerve impulses, but you know, there, there's nothing left and you're just sort of depleting the neuro transmitters and things like that. that one, you know, one, I, one, one comment on that. Yeah. You make a really good point. Like you've got to look at the training record and the individual really closely to work out if it's, if it's sensible because the risk of overtraining is quite high, right? If you start really hammering them with those, those, um, advanced techniques, um, what was I going to say? I'm just curious how you might reconcile that with someone who really wants that. So, you know, you've got someone out, do you, do you, have you ever worked with someone who is just an absolute beast can train to a single set to failure with perfect form and then wants to be hammered by a load of advanced techniques <laughs> and wants to train and wants yeah. to train twice a week, you know? Yeah. Um, just a, just a glutton for punishment. huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you're thinking, is this individual uh, genetically set up whereby they can still recover and improve with that ridiculous amount of stimulus? Um, or, or is this person just, you know, a masochist who's actually just going to really start to feel like crap in between their workouts and not recover and not get results? Just curious if you've ever worked with someone like that and how you manage that. Yeah. I mean, uh, number one, I would say that that type of person is rare. You know, normally you're not yeah. going to see that, see that in the typical client that comes through your door, but you know, sometimes, um, so, sometimes over the years I've had people where, Maybe they are just somebody that uh, has really been into this type of training, um, have have 
you know, followed it over the years. Maybe they've read Arthur Jones' works. They just had a personal interest or they've read Arthur Jones. They've read Ellington Darden's books. They've kind of followed the high intensity training. Maybe they used to do the Nautilus training back in the day and all this kind of stuff. And they've just stayed abreast of it. And they just have a really personal interest in, in, in the training and, and, and so forth. And they've done it for years. They may you know, come in with that kind of attitude that they just want to be crushed and, you know, <clears throat> the more the better kind of a thing. Um, but I, I would say other than that, m- most people are not not going to be in that that sort of category. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think one of the things that's, you know, the, the way our conversations go here, they often stimulate other other thoughts here. And one of the things that I've certainly seen where, you um, with this intensity, with this, especially these advanced techniques, um, you can push a person to such a deep state of fatigue and really just crush them so badly that that's going to take a very long time to recover from. Okay. And I think we've seen this with uh, some of the, some of the concepts that have been introduced into the high intensity field where training with, uh, more and more extended times, recovery times between workouts and training with fewer and fewer exercises in a workout. You know, I'm thinking kind of about Doug McGuff's uh, books and things where, you know, do the big five and train, you know, once a week. And then when you stop improving on that, then extend it out to 10 days in between workouts. And when you stop improving on that, extend it out to 14 days. And when you stop improving on that, cut it back from five exercises to three and in all of this kind of stuff. And I I think some of that concept uh, with this really extreme recovery period and very brief workouts with fewer and fewer exercises, I think some of this stems from sort of we're we're causing the problem in the first place. It's like, if you're just training beyond the failure and you're applying a lot of these advanced techniques and you're um, doing, you know, with the super slow protocol, there was a a technique called thorough inroad technique where Mm -hmm. you would train to failure and wherever you hit failure, you push and push and push for maybe 10 or 15 seconds against the immovable wall. Um, and just continuing to push and push and maximal effort. Then you would come down, uh, do a slow negative, turn around and attempt another rep. And then wherever that next rep fails again, you push and push and push for 10 or 15 (laughs) seconds and you keep exerting and exerting until which point you cannot even budge the weight from the bottom. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've done these partial reps and you've done all of this inroading after the point of failure. Uh, to the point you've got nothing left. And, you know, people used to brag about, you know, if you're doing arm curls or something, you would train so such a deep level of fatigue that even once the exercise was over, you couldn't lift your limbs. (laughs) Um, So that kind of thing with this, with this idea that just utterly train and drain every last drop of everything out of that muscle, and then simply rest as long as it takes to recover from that. But I think if you're doing that kind of stuff, number one, I don't think it adds any value, okay? Once you've achieved a failure, like I just mentioned earlier, once you've got a subject that truly trained a failure and gave you all they had, okay, once you've done that, I think you've stimulated everything you can stimulate, okay, from from that workout, um, or at least that that muscle group. So to do all of this stuff post-failure, just needlessly drains your system, exhausts your nervous system, just drains you down to the point of nothing, which then requires so much recovery time that you're, you're going beyond what's necessary to stimulate results and you're adding insult to injury and requiring such a lengthy recovery time or having to do a workout that has so few exercises in it that now you're not training enough either with enough frequency or with enough different exercises to adequately uh, cover the full body that you're forced to train in such a way that in order to survive that type of training, you have to train so briefly with so few exercises 
so that you can recover from it. But then again, you're not training enough with enough exercises and with enough frequency that you're really going to get optimal results. So, um, you know, with all of this stuff, I, I think it needs to be used sparingly and only used with people sort of as, as a way of getting a less compliant subject to train harder or to get to the proper level of fatigue. Um, you know, but, but you've got to kind of temper that with, you know, the subject you're dealing with. And if you, if you are getting a good solid effort in a true state of muscle failure that don't, don't do too much of that and maybe, maybe just occasionally do it as a sort of a hyper stimulation from time to time. You know, yeah. kind of thing, so thank you for that. Uh, just, just yeah. one thing I wanted to mention, and you mentioned body by science, and I think that I, I remember it saying in that book, and just to just to kind of not not that you were calling out Doug. I know you weren't doing that. You were just kind of no, saying no. that it's that it's no. that it's that kind of you're using it as a reference because it's that kind of message which is being kind of propagated out there in terms of like this this continuous reduction of volume and frequency but what he does say in volume of science is about advanced techniques he says i I could be uh, butchering this a little bit but he says you know use them sparingly because of the reasons we've already discussed in terms of overtraining um and obviously as you were saying regarding breaking the workout down over time to like a two or three-way split and then increasing the recovery time the way he does it and the way i believe it's it's stated in in body by science is how that waxes and wanes throughout the year so it's like you might you know have a maximal recovery period of like 11 14 days uh with a very consolidated program but then like the next month you go back to like a big five or more exercises once a week right so it's i like that approach where maybe there's value in you know, kind of oscillating up and down in that sense. And I remember, uh, pre- again, this is, I could be getting this a little bit wrong. Um, so James, you can correct me, but uh, Dr. James Fisher did a presentation at REC a couple of years ago where he basically looked at two groups who are training different frequencies over a long period of time. And the cool thing is they both ended up at the same place. So it kind of gives us license to experiment with these differing volumes and frequencies over time, because, Hey, maybe we all just end end up at the same place anyway. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I do want to make the point that when I brought that up, I certainly wasn't criticizing uh, Doug at at all or or anything like that. But I, I do think for a while, um, it seems to have calmed down a little bit, but I do think for a while this high intensity field had sort of uh, gotten to the point where it was almost, uh, you know, bragging rights <laughs> to to talk about how how infrequently you train and how few exercises you do in a workout um, with the corresponding concept being that you're so advanced and you're training so intensely that you know, you, you can only tolerate two exercises once every 14 days or something. Do you remember um, the, the Greg Anderson interview with um, Dave Durrell, where he, he was joking about, and well, he wasn't even joking. He was saying about how there'd be, there'd be um, uh, trainees in his waiting room, boasting about how infrequently they use, they work out or they use like the leg press. And one of them was like, you know, I, I, I have to use a leg press only once a month because I'm using such a heavy weight or working <laughs> right. so intensely. And um, right. Greg made a joke where he said something like he, he interrupted their conversation. I, I think this genuinely happened, if I remember from the conversation, where he just said to both of them, you know what, I can only look at the leg press. Like I can't even use it <laughs> because I'm so advanced or something to that effect, which I thought was so yeah, funny. Yeah. Very funny that, guy. That sounds like that sounds like something Greg would would say were you were you um, were you uh, quite familiar with greg yeah yeah definitely you know back in the day during the super slow exercise guild he was a yeah. fellow master instructor and uh you know he he really had a sense of humor and um was it was a funny guy and yeah. you know very successful uh trainer and and business owner um and for people that don't know greg did pass away a number of years ago so he's no longer with us, but uh, he was a great guy. I, I knew him well, and um, so, but, but yeah, I mean, that really illustrates the concept that um, I, I think this this whole thing, what we would refer to, I don't know if you're familiar with this concept, and but in the United States, where we would call, say that it sort of uh, 
jump shark. <laughs> okay. And uh-huh. the, the meaning it's, it's a, it's a phrase that describes that you really took it too far and <laughs> sort of got too, too crazy with it. And now it's to the point of ridiculousness. What's the phrase and, again? What is it? Uh, jump the shark. And, oh, I've never had that. No. Yeah. Where this concept comes from is, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the TV show, Happy Days. It yes. was like in the yeah. 1970s and there was Fonzie. Yeah. You, do, do you ever see that show? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it was well, sort of a little, well, yeah, this was a little bit before my time maybe, but I still watched some yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's an old, you know, comedy sitcom. Um, yeah. And it was a very popular show in the United States. And as the in one of the later seasons, it what happened is there was a, a show where um, Fonzie was going to jump his motorcycle over a shark tank, okay? And the the episode was so outrageous and it had gotten just so crazy that now this Fonzie guy was going to be doing this, you know, <laughs> feat of, you know, trying to jump his motorcycle over the shark tank. So, it, it kind of was marked as a point where the show just got too nutty and took it too far and that kind of stuff. So it kind of started this phrase that whenever something gets too far out of control and just to the point of ridiculousness, we refer to it as saying, boy, that's really jumped the shark or you know, something like that. Makes sense. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so with that in mind, I think, you know, high intensity training sort of jumped the shark with this idea that, you know, we can only tolerate a couple of exercises once every 14 days. And if we do anything more than that, we're overtrained. And, you know, I think it's just gotten crazy with that or did at one point. So I I think if we come back to the point that maybe a lot of this, this crazy advanced techniques or the thorough inroad technique or all of these things that we try to do to just annihilate somebody, I think number one, it's unnecessary and doesn't add any extra value, but it does kind of cause such an insult to our system. Uh, and you know, whether the muscles themselves or the nervous system or just systemic, you know, fatigue, that it gets to the point that, you know, if it's taking you that long to recover, there's a problem, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so we, we need to kind of balance it with doing enough exercise number one, enough different exercises in a workout that you're covering all the bases and doing all the the major muscle groups and so forth, but that you're also, you know, able to recover within a reasonable amount of time um, and and not have to have such extended recovery uh, periods. So, um, you know, a, a lot of this stuff, I mean, we pushed the envelope and we tried to, you know, follow this out to the point where let, let's try to create as much stimulation as we possibly can. But I do think there's a point that you've, you've done all you can and you've achieved optimal stimulation and doing anything above and beyond that is just, you know, not, not adding any extra. It, it, it makes me think of what um, Doug has been saying for a while and reiterated on my last podcast with him, which was that he saw a lot of people really who are really obsessed with the stimulus side of the equation really kind of struggled to get results for many years and were just you know overweight or um just not able to i guess continue to make gains and then when he said those people really address address the recovery side you know sleep nutrition stress management etc they then just started to really get results get much better body composition get better results from their workouts but it was less emphasis on their stimulus Stimulus. side of things um and so it's kind of Sorry, I thought we had a little, little delay there on the uh, connectivity, but um, it's it's kind of married, you know, connected to what you're saying there about you know this this obsession with the stimulus might be a bit misplaced. Yeah, and I think what we have here is that nobody truly knows exactly what the perfect level of stimulation is, and you know, there's no way to really measure when we've truly achieved that. So, you know, the concept was always been is like create as much stimulation as possible, create as much inroad, Mm. as much fatigue, et cetera, as possible. And then you can be reasonably assured that you, you know, stimulated enough. Okay. So I think part of it might be is that the level of stimulation required to promote, you know, changes and results and so forth is, 
is uh, you know at a level that we can, that can be achieved just by simply training to failure, okay, mm-hmm. um, and not applying all these extra techniques. But um, you know, getting too over the top with all of these advanced techniques or thorough inroading uh, uh, program, uh, you, you're just going too far, and you're creating a situation where you can't train with enough volume or enough frequency to to optimize. Yeah. Uh, results and things like that. So um, I, I do think we just need to balance all this and, and uh, you know, know who you're dealing with and, you know, realize that if you've, if you've got a good compliant subjects, that's giving you their all and doing the right things and achieving true failure, then, you know, you're just very brief and infrequent with, with these techniques, but somebody that's, that's sort of sandbagging and not giving you their all and not really getting truly uh, adequately stimulated, then pulling out your bag of tricks, so to speak, can then start to give you the ability to get them to work harder and force them to a little bit deeper level of fatigue. Yeah. Um, You know, so again, this, some of this stuff is just some of the art of being an instructor and knowing when you need to do these things, when you don't, or being able to recognize signs with your subjects and uh, what what it takes, and you know that that sort of thing. But um, you know, th- there's a there's a lot that goes in, into that, and being able to recognize things. But um, you know, I I, uh, I I think obviously for the most part, one of the problems is people do not train uh, hard enough. You know, certainly the average person that walks through our doors as a client, I I would say the biggest hindering factor is the fact that those people are not willing to work hard enough or they don't have the corresponding uh, workout skills to perform the exercises at a a high level and to uh, really get to a true state of momentary muscle failure and push themselves to to that effort, um, you know, and do all the right things that we'd like to see. So a lot of times we've got to spend uh, all this effort trying to get them to to work harder and to overcome some of these obstacles so that they they will work at a higher level. So uh, I I pretty much think probably the single greatest limiting factor from from the average person is the fact that uh, they're not willing to put up with the intensity and the hard effort that's required and the physical discomfort that comes along with that. And they sort of self limit themselves by, um, you know, hindering their results with that, that type of thing. So anything that we can do to get them to work a little bit harder to tolerate that and to, um, you know, get to a deeper level of fatigue, then certainly, you know, those kind of advanced techniques are going to be uh, legitimate um, and sort of a tool that we can use to do that. But, um, you know, this gets into areas too, where you've got to uh, recognize, again, who you're dealing with and what they will uh, tolerate, because you you also run the risk of uh, scaring people off if you do too much of this stuff and yeah, work them. Great work point. Them, yeah, work them too hard to the point that they'll just dread it so much that they'll just quit, you know? Um, So a lot of times- I had someone, one of my clients said, didn't want to work with me as a trainer because she said, I'm like a Nazi. Oh, jeez. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. No, I've I've heard those- I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Yeah, I've heard those kind of concepts. So, (laughs) you know, a a lot of times I, I look for signs, either the way somebody's behaving, uh, where they're reacting to some of the this stuff and maybe some of the comments that they make um like you know i'll get clients out of somebody where again this is coming from a person that's maybe not truly at failure and is working relatively hard and obviously getting to some of those uh, uh uncomfortable stages of the of the exercise and i'm i'm not implying that they're not really you know working fairly hard, but even coming from people that don't really truly reach a legitimate failure, you know, they'll start making comments like they'll, once the exercise is complete, they'll, you know, they'll sit there and shake their head and they'll go, oh my gosh, this is so hard. Gosh, this is just crazy. I can't believe how hard this is, you know, and, (laughs) and, 
<laughs> you know, it's like you want to be careful and you don't want to like uh, belittle them and say, ah, really, that wasn't yeah, that for sure. what you just did. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, 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 sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you, you got to find a way to, on the one hand, keep encouraging them and complimenting them that they're working hard, at least in their mind, um, but also encourage them to that they can you know do even better and make even more progress so yep. um you gotta watch yep. for those things yeah i it was it was it was it was very funny when i was told that for another trainer who um has a bit of a reputation for being a bit a bit uh, of a nice guy and uh, a little bit lower intensity and and he's he's sort of working on increasing that um and it, it was good feedback for me because it made me think the, one of the things I'm really interested in at the moment, and, and this is something we we definitely talk about in this series, is trying to find the Goldilocks intensity for the individual, right? And we have an intensity rating that we we kind of borrowed from Discover Strength in terms of giving each client a number so we can make sure we adapt the experience to them. And, and obviously, don't in some cases, you push them too hard, like you say, you'd scare them off. Um, and obviously, if someone's not, you know, if they're um, if they don't train, that's that that's worse than than training even at a, a, a sort of moderate intensity. And um, I just wanted to, I know we need to wrap up. So I just want to say a couple of things just to cap off some of the things you said. Um, regarding advanced techniques, I know one organization who were telling me that they realized they relied too much on advanced techniques. They were so into them that they relied too much on them in yeah. the workout. And it, it, it took away from that focus on that, the, um, effectiveness of this first set of the exercise, which I thought was fascinating. And they were actually put a strategy in place to, you know, retrain their team in order to get better at really focusing on that first set to muscular failure. Um, just for people thinking, you know, how do they measure this? The way we do it is we don't measure the advanced technique. So we measure the first set and then whatever we throw at them after that doesn't get measured. And the reason we do that is because it would just make the workout card way too complicated. Sometimes yeah. we, we'll make notes though about that in like a separate note section. Um, and then, yeah, and the last thing is, is I already kind of said it is just a, making sure that we adapt the intensity to the individual. Now I'm just, I'm just looking at the bullets, Tim. And, um, you know, I don't think we actually finished the first one, but that's okay. Cause this has been an awesome podcast and uh, <laughs> we've gone on some really cool tangents and I don't think advanced techniques is on our list here. So we kind of covered a lot of that off today. Um, yeah. what I'd like to do is just maybe finish off the first bullet regarding, uh, determining the optimal weight in the next episode together, because I think one of the questions we need to answer is when you get a new client, how do you find out exactly, well, what weight you should oh, use yeah. with that person? So let that, that is going to be a long conversation. So let's, let's do that next time. Um, yeah. what's the best way for people to uh, connect with you to find out more about your services? Cause I know you, you need to wrap up for a client now. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say probably the best approach is just to go to my website, which is uh, strong life training dot com and through the website my phone number is listed there there's a email um, a address listed there there's a contact form listed there so whether they want to call me send me an email or just fill out the contact form through the website that that's probably the best best approach so okay all right thank you very much for that and looking forward to part is this part five isn't it part six and many yeah. more as well to cover the rest of these awesome bullets that we've got here um and for everyone listening to find a blog post for this episode and a blog post for this entire series so far and to download the pdf transcript for this episode please go to highintensitybusiness.com click podcast search for episode 361 and until next time thank you very much for listening This episode is brought to you by ARX. You want to be a successful strength training studio owner. The problem is you aren't able to deliver the safest, most efficient and effective workouts, making it harder for you to attract and retain clients, which makes you feel frustrated. I understand that it can be difficult to differentiate your business without the right tools. ARX's Breakthrough Adaptive Resistance Technology uses patented motorized resistance and computer software to give you and your clients the perfect workout every single time. 
BioFit founder John Zarbok says that ARX is clearly the superior tool to deliver the exercise stimulus. My clients are seeing insane improvements in weeks, not months. I could not fathom running my business without ARX. So here's how you get started. Number one, go to arxfit.com forward slash HOB to get $500 off your ARX machines. Number two, book a call with the ARX sales team. And number three, learn how ARX can help you grow your strength training business. Go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB so you can stop struggling to attract and retain clients and start to grow your strength training business with confidence.